We came and made a start. Um, firstly, thank you, Graham, for inviting me here today. Firstly, to introduce myself, I act as head of education within public policy, working alongside Anthony Davis on our public sector partner. If you don't know us, Howard Dobson has three offices in Cardiff, London, and Swansea. The company was set up in 1966, and I joined exactly I'm here to talk about 21st century schools. Behind me are five most recent schools. At the top is Bays Lake in Newport. Down from that is Hawthorne in Berlin near Pont de Alongside that is Kevin Sykeson, which I'll be referring to later during my presentation. But for now, I'll be focusing on the bottom two. Next slide, please. So Eastern High School and Cardiff West Community Campus are situated at either side of Cardiff in Trowbridge and Ely, respectively. Both schools were completed in the last five years as part of the 21st Century Schools Programme. They represent a milestone in Paradox and School Design, coinciding with the introduction of the Donaldson Report in 2015. The Donaldson Report reviewed the existing curriculum and assessment arrangements for prevalent schools. It recognised that each child should be able to benefit from an education that will best meet their present needs and equip them for their future lives, regardless of background. To quote Graham Donaldson from his report, our children and young people only have a relatively short time at school. We must use that time judiciously and productively to help each one of them to grow as a capable, healthy, well-rounded individual who can thrive in the face of unknown future challenges. The new national curriculum in Wales should have six areas of learning and experience. Expressive arts, health and well-being, humanities, languages, literacy and communication, mathematics and numeracy, and science and technology. Children and young people should have their learning developed across the curriculum through three cross-curriculum responsibilities that should be the responsibility of all teachers. Literacy, numeracy, and digital competence. The expectations for the three cross-curriculum responsibilities and the wider skills should be embedded within the areas of living and experience. All children and young people should make progress along the same continuum, regardless of any additional learning needs they may have, although they may reach a link between progression steps more slowly and more quickly than others. Eastern High School was the first secondary school I worked on at Powell Dobson in early 2015. The school was built on the site of the old Cardiff and Vale College campus in Trowbridge and it replaced the old Eastern High School on the program. Cardiff and Vale College had recently completed a large new building on Dumbles Road in the city centre, and this released the site for development. The college retained several workshops to the north of the site that were kept live throughout the building. The existing Eastern High School building was in a bad state of repair with leaking roofs and polycarbonate windows that had yellowed so much that you could not see through them. It had recently been named by national media as one of the worst performing schools in the UK. The existing buildings were demolished as part of enabling works by Cardiff County, County Council ahead of possession by Will Monkinson, the contractor for the works. And the site was bounded by a wildlife sanctuary to the south, primary school to the north, and community playing fields to the east. The new school comprised of both grass and 3G pitches, numerous multi use games courts, and playgrounds to the south of the school building. We looked at various options for the mass in the new school, but agreed upon the super block. This was efficient in plan, reducing circulation, and proved cost effective to build. Sites are rarely large enough when designing secondary schools. 
and Eastern High was no exception. An additional parcel of land was secured to the east to accommodate the 3G pitch and also to accommodate all the other external spaces required as part of the roof. The building is orientated so that the long southern facade enjoyed, enjoys views of the sports grounds onto the way of sanctuary on the wall. The building was pushed back from the road to create a plaza for use by the local community. The plaza acts to welcome the local community into the school and encourage use of the front portion of the school, including cafe and sports facilities and events. Cardiff and Vale College also maintained a presence at the front of the building, including a restaurant and science labs. So, Staff parking and service areas are positioned separately at the north of the school, with the building itself subdividing the site, providing a barrier and ensuring the pupils are completely separate from the building. The floor plan of Eastern High is based around three large double height spaces. So there's the cafe area at the front of the school, the dining area at the middle of the school that has direct access to external seating areas for summer months. And finally, the library and resource space at the rear. These large spaces break up the cellular organization of classrooms, bring a large amount of natural light into the center of the building and act as a flexible learning area that can be used for a variety of events. The challenges of the restricted site and the choice of the super block form generated these three showcase spaces. Long and ending corridors are replaced with circulation that breaks out into large vibrant spaces with intermittent views of the landscape to the south. Slide, please. Departments are positioned due to their requirements. Design technology requires direct deliveries from the service yard. Science and external teaching spaces, such as a small allotment at the rear of the building, which is on the right of the image there. And maths was located centrally around a flexible teaching space, which is the uh, section in the middle. Music and drama were positioned adjacent to the main hall. Excuse me. The floor plan has three levels of security based on the building's operational requirements. A semi-public space at the front. This is accessible to the local community and developers to access the cafe, sports hall, changing rooms and sports fields. A central space that can be open to the public for specific events, such as school plays and open days. And the rear of the building, which is space is secure for school on rooms. This is the cafe in six form space, just past reception. So the cafe is in the background and the seating space at the front. And you can see that those doors house staff offices in the admin team uh, directly around that area so that um, the community can come in and uh, use that space. Um, parents and things can be held in that space. That's all. This is the central dining space, which can double as a display area. And again, you can see a good level of natural light from the roof lights above. And finally, the private library space at the rear end, which is split over two levels. Slightly. At first floor, the school is entirely private and consists primarily of standard classrooms. The building floor plans had already been fully developed when the Dorrance report was released by Welsh Government. Although much of the project had already been fixed, we incorporated some of the design ethos within the new report into the floor plans. Several traditional classrooms uh, in the black boxes there um, were omitted in favour of open plan learning spaces, incorporating the space allocation several classrooms at once. Two or more classrooms groups can be taught together and subdivided by ability. 
So one of the teachers, for example, can take a small group of five pupils who might be excelling in that, that given subject. Um, another teacher can take the main um, body of students, and then a further teacher can take uh, the students that are struggling. And here is what those spaces look like uh, in the completed building. You can see the movable screens and lecture style seating that can be repositioned to subdivide the space. There are also small group rooms that can be used scattered around these large spaces. Eastern High has transitioned from a school that pupils hated attending to a school with high attendance figures. It has moved on from being named one of the worst performing schools in the UK having a waiting list of pupils applying to be part of the school. The playing fields and other community areas are always fully worked and are well kept. There is very little graffiti or vandalization as the local community has embraced the school and what it represents. A brighter future for the next generation, key message of the Dolores movement. Next slide. Please. The second case study is Cardiff West Community Campus. Again, working with Cardiff County Council and alongside Wilmot Dixon, but this school was designed with the Donaldson Report in mind from the get-go. Excellent. The old school, Glendaru High, burned down in 2016. In 2017, we started work on the new school, adjacent to Trelai Park in Lewis, directly alongside the A4323. The new school combined with the adjacent primary and semi schools to the north to make up the campus. Cardiff West is made up of three separate buildings. So you've got the main super block in the middle, housing the main 11 to 16 teaching areas. A smaller sports block containing the sports hall and changing facilities on the left, and a post 16 block dedicated for A level and one on A1. The Donaldson report proposes six areas of learning, two of which are on the ground floor expressive arts on the right, health and well being on the left, and in addition, the new school contained accommodation dedicated to the primary school and separate send facilities at the rear. Next slide, please. At first floor, you can see the remaining areas of learning. Science and technology at the top, humanities on the left, mathematics and numeracy on the right, and language, literacy, literacy and communication at the bottom. Each is arranged around a central flexible learning base, which is the dark zone shown in each of those spaces. Next slide, please. Both of the protected foundation areas and SEN areas at the school have their own flexible learning bases, sharing the aspiration of the Donaldson Report, as well as the school itself. The following, um, on, by following the Donaldson report, we were able to cluster departments alongside others within their own areas of learning. On the ground floor, next slide please, and on the first floor. Excellent, okay. Um, we also considered how these areas would be continued between buildings and outdoors. An outside, outside teaching amphitheatre, science gardens, construction yard, outdoor dining, uh, touching on biophilic design were all employed in the school grounds. A key driver within the new school was for it to unite the adjacent primary and skin, skin, sorry, SEN schools into a learning campus. It was all about creating aspiration in an underprivileged area in a school that struggled with its elements. The foundation area has a dedicated external teaching space, 
and so forth with the image. Uh, that supplements those available within the adjacent primary school. The post 16 building on the right was created as a separate building again to generate aspirations for higher learning. The post 16 building targets practical subjects that be within the area, such as construction skills, care and beauty, and links to the BBC with their own radio station. The open frontage was important for the school as it encouraged the local community care to care for the school and embrace its aspirational symbology as at Eastern High. Again, vehicles are kept completely separate to pupil areas. So you can see the vehicle areas on the left of the image or the pupil areas towards the right. And like Eastern High, the local community has access to the sports hall and sports fields to the north and south. In this case, the sports hall is physically separated to the system of our use. At first floor, flexible spaces have been designed in since the start of the project. Every area of learning benefits from a dedicated flexible learning space. At the front of the main block, an equivalent area of three classrooms was given over to the language, literacy and communication area. In the centre of the plan, mathematics and the humanities each had a base. And at the rear, science received an open plan demonstration area in addition to a separate lecture area. This gives maximum opportunity for flexible teaching methods across all areas of learning. The images on the left represent visualizations of two of the flexible learning spaces, uh, which should be, as I mentioned, be designed in the from the get go. The other images represent the final spaces complete with furniture. Again, furniture can be repositioned to subdivide each space depending on the lesson and the pupil groups in attendance. Power sockets were positioned in the floor, and colour branding was also a key component between areas of learning and across buildings, again to emphasise the aspects of the building. Pupils were consulted throughout the whole of the design and construction stage to reinforce ownership by the community, a school for the community, designed by the community. Okay, I've talked about flexible teaching spaces in the Cardiff schools and how furniture plays a key part in the successful operation of those spaces. Finally, I'm going to talk about the integration of furniture into the design process of Kevin Sison School. So we developed the design of Kevin Sison from RIBA stage two using BIM. The site was constrained, which would preclude certain building footprints, such as the super block footprint on Cardiff East and Cardiff West. We wanted to replicate certain aspects that had made the previous school successful, such as the double height dining space as a central hub. Here in RIBA stage three, we developed several iterations of the design, except the one you can see here. It looks a bit like the British Isles from above. It's quite handy during COVID because we could say you were up in Wales or up in the north of Scotland. And all the subcontractors knew that property to open up. While we were developing the design of the building, we can currently work on how the spaces within the building would be populated with furniture. The furniture layouts were fed into intensive consultation, which Stuart's already touched on, with building end users. But as Stuart has already alluded to, the breaking communication there is that we were presenting to the local authority uh, and the contractor, not directly to the end users. I think a lot of the, the conversations were lost in translation a little bit um, between ourselves and, and the end users. So that, that's a lesson learned for future schools. I think it's something we're keen to, to rectify. The cataloging of legacy items and integration of the design of the new school is also a key consideration. So by, by combining the two BIM models, we were able to demonstrate to our client, for example, how the internal spaces would appear. The detailed furniture BIM model also gave other benefits. Each individual component 
within the model holds variable data that can be used in a variety of ways. So in this case, in the, um, the instance of the chair, um, it holds three key sets of data for us at an early stage. It holds the group in, which means um, is it contract contractor supply? Is it client supply and contractor fit group two? Is it client supply in two group, group three? Or is it X in four? And that means that we can keep a good understanding of the costs as the design of the FP progresses. Uh, furniture could also be included within the coordination of the building, which is something that's often forgotten. So that as architects, we coordinate the structure engineer and the MEP engineer, but also there's a, a coordination exercise to be done with the furniture itself. So for example, if you've got teaching walls, we don't necessarily want columns, etc. You know, there's doors you cut down the amount of teaching um, wall space. All of this is coordinated in at an early stage. So as we go into contract, uh, it's all sort of buttoned out. Uh, detailed schedules could quickly be produced for outlining costing, dependent on whether they were included in the contract. And changes to room layouts could be quickly captured in relation to costing. C sheets were provided for the sign off of individual rooms. These enable the project team and end users to visualize the spaces and input into the design, as already mentioned. Furniture immediately sets the scale of the room and makes it instantly related to the room. We were able to walk through the building in real time during client meetings or produce rendered views to demonstrate transparency of design. Kevin Sison was almost entirely built throughout the COVID, COVID pandemic. Our site presence dramatically reduced as a result. BIM enabled teams to work in isolation, but bring information together quickly and to make informed decisions. I'm incredibly proud of the team involved with Kevin Sison. Morgan Sindel and the whole of the supply chain involved, including the Ministry of Furniture, all pulled it out of the bag due to incredibly trying time. And my hope is that in time, Kevin Sison benefits the local community and prepares local young people for the future in keeping with the aspirations of the Donaldson Report. Okay, finally, because I know everyone's keen to get out to this cold warehouse and on to lunch. Um, the theme of today is uh, If Devoddle, the future. I wanted to end by showing what will hopefully be a very exciting future for the Alpha Valley. We are currently working on the Wild Fox project for Wild Fox Resorts. Approximately five miles of the drone flies from where we sit today, an exciting opportunity exists for the Alpha Valley. The hope is that the resort will tie into wider cycle networks and also the hope is that it helps it support existing businesses in the area. On a steeply sloping site just south of Kuma, formerly used for forestry, and prior to this it was used for coal mining, we're hoping to develop the site. So Wild Fox is an outdoor adventure resort with lodge and hotel accommodation. It has a variety of activities across the site. It has a series of downhill mountain biking trails and tree chop journeys, walking trails for people of all abilities and skill levels, and the site aim is to operate under an all-electric car-free policy. Arrival is from the west of the site, and a new access has been created from the main road. The main approach climbs through the forest to the entrance pavilion. Guests check in remotely at the entrance pavilion where they are guided towards the hotel and lodge. There will be a combination of online check-in and drive-through check-in at the pavilion. The hotel itself sits fairly central to the site, a short walk from the rock and wild and the spa, which together form the central plaza. 
All three buildings are arranged around central water bodies in which kayaking and water skiing are All of the car parking for the site is buried under the hotel itself. And upon check-in, cars will remain under the hotel until check-out. It's a hotel, conference centre, and a large dining centre for the whole resort. Lodges themselves are scattered around the site. Single-storey lodges are placed on flatter areas of the site, while larger double-storey lodges are integrated into the landscape. All lodges benefit from great views across the landscape. Lodges range in size from single story two bedroom floor plans to larger two story five bedroom lodges. The lodges are fabric first approach to energy consumption. They'll be modular, be fabricated off site, and they're heated by air source heat pumps. They use no gas appliances, which with the current situation is only a good thing. The spa is situated alongside the hotel at the other end of the central plaza. It is high enough to have good views out over the landscape. And it's as if the George Robin scenery isn't relaxing enough, the luxury spa would be one of the best in Wales. The spa is approached across a bridge and the internal spa journey is around, ranged around a series of courtyards. There are individual treatment rooms as well as shared facilities like pools, sauna, and ice rooms. An exciting building at the centre of the site is the Rock and Wild. Indoor canyoning experience and water park. Plunge pools, cliff faces, and waterfalls for climbing. Also, a section of downhill rapids which actually go outside the building. At the summit of the whole site sits the summit building. This houses a series of downhill activities downhill mountain bikes, downhill luges, downhill trikes, and zip wires, all serviced from the cafe in this building. Located near the Eastern Lodges is the Mountain Building. The building acts as a starting point for all activities on the site. You can get a jeep up to the summit from here, and the building itself contains a family adventure area, VR spaces, and a climbing and bouldering hall. Wild Fox is currently in for planning and will open entirely in its entirety once complete. The two gentlemen at the back there are my colleagues. And they get involved directly with the project. So if you've got any questions, they are meant to ask. Thank you. For, this is the concludes the presentation. I'm open the floor to questions.